Hi, everybody. Welcome back to SuperCloud 6. We're here live in our studio in Palo Alto. I'm Dave Vellante with John Furrier. George Gilbert is here as well. I'm really pleased to welcome Uday Kiran Medesetti, who is a Cube alum and is a distinguished engineer at Uber, developing you know, the app that we all love. Uday, welcome. Thanks for coming out to our studio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. So we're super interested in learning about the platform that you're building, and it's not just you, it's your team. You have a very large team. We had you on a breaking analysis uh, last year and really yeah. dug into it. So we want to extend that. Let's start with the platform. You're thinking yeah. about the platform and going back to, I think it was around 2015 when you guys started developing this. How were you thinking about platform and how are you thinking about evolving? This is of course before Gen, a Gen AI, you had to forecast what was going to happen technology wise and business wise, but you can't tell for sure. Yeah. So what went into that platform thinking and the decisions you made back at that time to enable you to thrive as you are today? Yeah, yeah. you know, I think uh, we, like Uber, you know, with our CEO Dara said, like Uber is a giant machine intelligence problem. You know, we are trying to navigate the physical world and there's a lot of complexity the physical world brings and we need to model in the differences in various business lines, various geographies, how different cities work, how people work in the physical world into our systems. And obviously, you know, we, we cannot predict what's going on, but we need to stay, um, stay agile to adapt best in the industry and then figure out what works for us. You know, back in, I think the platform that you talked about was how we uh, redesigned our core ordering system uh, back in 2015, the state of that was, hey, like internet scale applications can only be built using NoSQL systems. Um, and fast forward to four years, five years, and then we see em emergence of new SQL kind of systems where we get the horizontal scalability and we also get the asset properties. So that's when we took a leap of faith um, back in 2018, 2019. If we were to rethink our core ordering system for internet scale applications using new SQL, what would we do? And then we did a two year rewrite and now the core system that handles all of the online orders, all the online driver sessions, that's all built using a new SQL spanner kind of system. And, and we also have a lot of other systems that leverage a most cost efficient internal storage system so that for we can pick the right technology for the right use case, and then we can stay nimble if, if some new system comes like Pino that we need for an OLAP kind of use cases, then we plug in uh, that system where, we, where it, we, we see there's a good fit. So I want to ask you about just philosophy. I remember the, remember the old data center days when, it, when a disk drive broke, you went and replaced it. You had yeah. to call somebody and they came in to fix it, and then when the cloud came about, they architected it, so you didn't have to worry about it. You know, disk drive breaks, throw it away. You just keep running. Do you have a similar philosophy with software? In other words, you had to develop some code that didn't exist. I mean, it might have been the semantic layer to make things more coherent, whatever that is. But do you have a, a, a mindset of, we, we, we will throw the code away, like Tesla just supposedly did, and, 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 and rewrite it, or do you have the mindset of, we must be able to maintain that and evolve it? What's that philosophy? See, I think uh, that's a, uh, I mean, we always, I mean, we cannot always keep rewriting it every one, right. two years. We have to have a pragmatic choice on whether it makes the right sense for that right time. And we also have to think longer term on if we were to think for the next five years, does this architecture handle the kind of scale that we are predicting for the next five years? So when we see there's a right fit, sometimes we may be too early trying to move something, uh, but when we see that, okay, it's ripe for a rewrite because we know that fundamentally it's not able to handle the kind of growth that we envision in that particular area, that's when we take uh, that bet. And when we take that bet, we also need the full organizational commitment to follow through that because you cannot have many dangling rewrites going on then it creates a lot more mess than like the, what we can, uh, what we started with. So Uday, back to the, where, where Dara positioned this as a, Uber is a machine intelligence problem. Yeah. Tell us about AI starting, give us the context at multiple scales. First, like how it helps you plan at the city level, yeah. you know, like how to anticipate surges of demand or bring on more, more drivers or how you think about route planning, or then AI at the trip level where you're doing matching and yeah. calculating you know, routes and, and fares, and then 
um, maybe AI even at the management of operations level. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, it's not like one single machine learning model that is that solves every leg of the ordering life cycle for us. Uh, what we try to focus on is democratize creation of machine learning models within the company so that if you take the entire life cycle of you know, figuring out the right set of features, and creating the data pipelines for that, doing the model evaluation, then deploying that to production at scale, any kind of like along with data engineers, machine learning engineers, applied scientists, software engineers, they can work collaboratively inside our machine learning platform to discover the features, to build new models and, and ship it to production. And what that enables us is now we have hundreds of machine learning models in production, optimizing every phase of the order life cycle. Whether we have like powerful deep neural model that is predicting what is the AI, what is the ETA for the trip. We have personalization models that predicts if Dave opens the Uber app, what, what product we should suggest him. Uh, if you open the Uber Eats app, what specific item we should suggest you so that we can optimize the conversion rate. And it's also optimizing not just end users, but also internal users. As engineers, we want, this is the kind of costly commodity, right? Like how do you get, yeah. how do you optimize the life of engineers with AI? So we kind of look at every, life, every phase of the engineering life cycle and how we optimize that with AI. So one thing that came up earlier from the startup panel we had earlier, the, the hot young guns rising up, getting their Series B, a lot of doing a lot of things that's very Uber-like. Yeah. The question that came up was with vector embeds, yeah. it does a great job of identifying context. Yeah. But behavioral data is where the personalization comes in. What you're getting at is, as you look at the system at scale, I mean, doing it in isolation, okay, I get that, doing some embeds, do some retrieval. But to get that, that's what I'll say, it's kind of, and it is a search problem, but like to get it right with context and behavioral data. Yeah. How do you look at that problem? Because a lot of people are, are looking at Gen AI right now saying, I get the contextual behavioral interaction. That was the old search days, now it's in real world. At scale, what does it look like? How should people be thinking about this? Yeah, so um, I think we are in the early innings of how, what kind of end user experiences we can build with the new trend in LLMs and RAG models. What we are trying internally is, can we provide access to the best in class proprietary models and open source models to all of our engineers and data scientists so that we can do a lot of experiments and see what works. Um, so we have internal deployments where we optimize how we do code reviews or how we do write tests, how we automate UI tests, or we have we optimize the life of our agents yeah. where they are, do, they are in, in solving users' problems. Uh, ultimately, like we need to take the static world knowledge and we need to join it with Uber-specific semantics and knowledge graph and user-specific context. Like if I'm trying to onboard to Uber and if I have a question that, hey, like why am I not, why, what is stopping me to take a ride? We need to take Uber's information about all the requirements you need and this user-specific information about what have they done so far and we can give them an answer in a format in which they like you're that combining for them. You're combining those. And real quick clarification, when you say proprietary models, do you mean proprietary data from you guys or proprietary models being OpenAI and Thropic? Yeah, uh, proprietary models like OpenAI or Gemini okay. and stuff like that. And then integrating that with internal Uber data, that's where vector search and rack comes in where, you know, because we need to be careful about yeah. what kind of data exposure we are providing to these companies because we are also in the early phases of like figuring out the data access policies and security. So we, we want to take the more conservative side, like in cases where, you know, we, we in some cases we leverage open source models, so we deploy them uh, on-prem within our VPN, so then we can be absolutely sure there is no data leakage. In mm -hmm. cases where we assume, uh, proprietary models, then we are more on use, we're not trying to use any user's data, we are more trying to, you know, help engineers or like in uh, access, providing, using information that is not You're controlling uh, the state exactly. of that exactly. LLM and by controlling what you feed what, in. What you feed in. You're not exactly. relying on their data with hallucinations. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To prompt it, right? So let me ask, Uday, you made a reference to the, the Uber knowledge graph and um, knowledge graph is kind of, kind of like this hot, sort of meme right now, but I want to more ask you about when you organize your data into a model of your business. Yeah. 
are you doing that with a knowledge graph? And then are you using that to feed the context into LLMs for different use cases? And can you give us examples? Yeah, um, I think uh, we are also in the early phase of building a knowledge graph with Uber business semantics that, that we can leverage to build the right LLM applications. But in a traditional machine learning models, whether it's like, you know, XGBoost or deep learning models there, we have like a like a very strong data lake with uh, with uh, uh, with really good quality data pipelines that we can use to build features that engineers use to build machine learning models so that's kind of our data lake and and we are now augmenting that with um, what kind of format or knowledge graph that we need to also build the next generation of llm applications so just to be clear what is today like a bunch of tables which have columns which masquerade as features might tomorrow be organized into a knowledge graph so that it's easier for the data analysts, the data scientists to consume, to find, to combine when they're building traditional yeah. machine learning statistical models or even feeding data into content into LLM. Yeah, I mean, even today we have a, a variant of that, like we have a system called data book where any data engineer or any machine learning engineer can go there and get access to the tables, like what are the relationships with other tables, the column names, descriptions, what are the data access policies, what are the business classifications of that data. That allows anyone to come in, find all of the data sources that are blessed and do accurate data analysis, trusting that the data that they're using is, uh, is accurate and complete. So those are, that's your data products today are manifested in this catalog. Exactly. Okay. Um, so George and I were talking earlier, let me set it up, George, yeah. and you can get into it. We kind of, the question was like, how much is AI versus human, right? But so it's kind of a weird question, but when you think about a trip function, yeah. you know, we talked about, okay, you got riders and drivers and ETAs and, 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 and cost, et cetera. And, and you build a workflow yeah. out of that. We're trying to figure out, okay, how much is, is procedural and how much is, is AI and how has that changed over time? So, see, I think in general, we try to, um, one of the core important aspects that we need to always think about is reliability. Like at the end of the day, if everything goes down, what can, what can be the least common experience that we can serve the user? Because users trust us to go from A to B to get paid for a particular trip. So, in some sense, we have you know, most of our core trip flow functions are procedural, like you know, we have different microservices that handle different aspects of these services. And there also we, are, we think about what is the degraded experience look like. And where we use machine learning is how do we optimize every leg of the journey? Like I can, I can tell you a five minute ETA, but maybe if I use a machine learning model, I can tell you it's exactly three minutes, 20 seconds. But it's, if, that part of the system is not working, it's better to tell you five minutes rather than, hey, I can't do a trip without that. And, so and, that's and kind of the- Where it's maybe a little off, I've noticed, but that's okay because the application is up, you know, and you're optimizing in Brewer cap theorem, yeah. Brewer's theorem. Same thing with each personalization. I can tell you like your nearest restaurants, um, at least you can order something instead of saying, hey, like I can't tell you what, what, what you might order yeah, that day. Right. So the resilience is implemented as rules that are procedural with a, um, like a, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. It's yeah, first is the AI, um, which gives you the optimal experience, but if that's not working, you have rules to fall back on. Yeah, I mean, if you think about various checkpoints across the trip life cycle, there is a checkpoint where I might want to access the ETA. That checkpoint behind the scenes can leverage, can use a machine learning model inferencing to predict, okay, what might be the ETA, but, it has a fallback experience to w what might be a, maybe fallback to historical data, maybe fallback to more static rules for that city. Um, and like even the feed that I gave, like there's a fallback feed that tells you some degraded experience, but there is a machine learning powered experience that looks at a lot of context to tell you the right set of um, restaurants to serve you to optimize the conversion. How about thinking about you know, macro AI? Um, you know, across the life cycle. Yeah. Uh, how, how much is AI sort of spreading across that life cycle, whether it's data engineering or 
AI ops or even extending out to the user experience? Is it, should we think of it as sort of an overlay in the whole system or is it more injected into the different components? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of injected in yep. every step of an engineer's life cycle, every step of a machine learning engineer's life cycle, every step of user experience life cycle. Um, and then we think about at that leg, what kind of machine learning model might give us the best ROI. It could be a maybe simple traditional machine learning model or it could be a new, new age LLM kind of model that can optimize that experience. Um, but within all, we, so, so this is interesting to understand how it's injecting and enhancing at many steps. What is there um, some outer loop where you say, I want to optimize this city you know, this month for maximum profitability, or I want to improve, you know, rider experience, so I want more liquidity. Is there some way to link an overall objective to the, the behavior of all these specialized models and all these different workflow steps? Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, different models are optimizing different phases. They are kind of in some, in most cases, mutually exclusive, right? Like me trying to optimize what specific, um, product I want to show you in the product selection may or may not be the same model that has to really decide what specific matching function that I need to evaluate. Um, and in cases where they need to, they need to work together, then we, uh, then we make sure like, you know, we have mechanisms in place where uh, they, they work together. Guys, I want to bring up something real quick while you're here. I know this is a good topic on deep dive, but as you guys are successful, you're like a leader in what you're doing. You're an innovator. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Other enterprises are now kind of catching up. They're reading about the reports. Um, we had a debate earlier on about what's this new group that's emerging in enterprise. You guys are kind of the first ones to kind of, not first, but first wave of innovators. But in your basic enterprise that are now going cloud native, yeah. they've had data analytics for years. Data yeah. warehouses, we've been covering it. Uh, deep, deep lease, you see Snowflake, Databricks, Data Lake. But now a new department's emerging, a new persona. That's to rein this in. Is it cloud native, cloud operations? Is it data centers? Is it co software engineering, platform engineering, or is it data science? Because not one department does this now. Exactly. What do we call this? And I think, as you said rightly, it's not necessarily one department, right? Like even today, like when we have to bring a machine learning model to production, in the initial stages, you might need a data engineer who thinks about building high quality data pipelines. Then you need a applied scientist who thinks about what specific features and how do I create that model. Then you might need a machine learning engineer to convert this into a model that I can deploy to production. Then you need a software engineer to run this at scale for millions of QPS that we need to handle. And so... Yeah, it's a multi-discipline, it's, it's, it's a system. It, exactly, and you need some platform engineers to think about what are the common bells and whistles that I can provide to all of these folks so that they can, they can focus on their core business logic without worrying about integrations across Uber and external systems. This is why I bring it up because a lot, you guys, I know this is not the Uber conversation, but for our other conversations where these young startups and innovators, they want to be the supplier to the enterprise. If the enterprise has to form their own teams, the vendors don't have the answers because they don't, they're one dimensional. They don't sit, they don't fit the system. So the, so the thesis is who serves the enterprise? Because you can't just roll and say, hey, I'm big time database company or I'm a networking company or I'm an observability company. So they might put, not have the one. the pieces together? Well, what we're hearing and what we're seeing is that it's the systems team, if you want to call it that, for lack of a better name. But the it, Uday, Uday, that's that's a perfect chance to, to describe now how Uber is becoming a fleet management app. It's not just your in-house app. Maybe maybe because what you were getting at was they've built a system, a coherent system out of you know many pieces, many of which they had to develop. But now you're selling. Oh, no, but no. John's trying to understand. No, like, or if I'm if I'm say Cisco or I'm a company, and I want to sell to Uber or an enterprise. They don't have the team. I'm selling to IT in the old days. Then I'm selling to data scientists or some some analytics yeah. solution. Oh, yeah. that's I'm selling it. databases to yeah. that person over there, and oh, the DevOps team is over there. Like, who the hell's in charge? Yeah, and and it doesn't stop there, right? Like even. Like you also need some observ observability integrations because if you're running a model in production, you need to con you need to get the feedback loop, get the metrics, see how it's performing. Then you need some 
integrations with all of your metrics, alerts, and monitoring uh, tools. So, yes, I think like companies need some way to integrate all of these different things and think about the entire life cycle. Otherwise, it's it takes a, it has a lot of burden on individual cohorts to really get and move fast. We're going to come back to this topic, but I'll let George, because George's on a good thread. I want to get to that. Can, can I just interject something for a second? So because Uber has such had such an impact on the economy. I mean, yeah. some companies like Amazon as, as well, but you think about the gig economy, the ability to self-serve, uh, a, a surge in demand. I heard just recently that restaurants are going to now do surge pricing. Um, so, you know, thanks for that. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but, so my question, invented, we important. use, right, we, but we use, Uber for all as a metaphor for the future of being able to build a digital twin of business, people, places, and things, which you sort of re referenced earlier. Kind of knowing what you know now, do you feel like AI will enable the, the masses without thousands of engineers to, to actually create an Uber-like experience for their own business while you go off and invent some new stuff that we can then copy 10 years down the road? Um, or, or, or do you feel like there's still a, a, a giant gap between you know what you were able to achieve and what the masses will be able to achieve. See, I think you know if you think about the amount of effort it takes to build an internet scale application ten years ago versus now. Right. There's a lot of off-the-shelf tools that can get you to a relatively good state with very small number of engineers. Um, now, getting from zero to one is one thing, and getting from one to 100 and getting to a global scale, understanding all of the local policies and making sure your system adheres to that. That's where you need maybe a bigger workforce to be able to like, you know, b translate that into a working system. Mm. Uh, but getting to a zero to one, like looking at what's going on in the industry, I think like you, you don't need a large team to do something right. quick, uh, something that solves a specific niche. Great, George. Maybe, maybe then the, take that thought and elaborate on um, Uber has, you know, been maturing its platform and application for you know yep. well over ten years. Talk, if you can, briefly about the fleet management. But you were mentioning earlier about how you can plug in providers and customers with different business models and and different essentially requests if I understood it, yeah. so that, and you were just saying you, that has to be adapted to different local conditions. So talk about how Uber is becoming this platform independent of Uber the service. Yeah, you know, you know think of it as um, when, you, when we first started, um, every rider is maybe using Uber rider app to request a ride, and then every driver on the platform has onboarded to Uber as a first part. Now, over time, Instead of riders requesting through Uber app, we can expose API, we can to, to hotels, to health organizations, so that they can provide Uber-like experience for their guests, for their patients. Yeah. That's on the consumer side. So then you have 1P3P model. And then on the, on the provider side, then we can provide APIs for large fleets, so then they can bring in their hundreds of vehicles, thousands of vehicles onto Uber platform, so that they can optimize their overall fleet efficiency because we have enough liquidity in the marketplace that we are able to give to them, which they might not be able to get on their own. Yeah, this is exciting, George. We talked about the, you know, the Sabre example, right? The, the original company that built something internally and then sold it to the industry and became a standard, certainly Amazon, similar. And was worth more than the underlying airline. Yeah, the, the, the rusty asset. Is that right? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, the rusty yeah. asset versus the software company. Yeah, well, well, Uber, has sense, all, exactly. Uber has all that data. They have the scale. They have all that information. They're leveraging and the, the, the data. Liquidity. And liquidity. And so yeah. why, why build it when I can buy it from Uber and then focus on my business? And then that's your scale model. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the new way. George, we'll give you the, the, the floor here. Maybe a, a, another question on, um, you know, we've been talking, we've been touching on Gen AI. Have you, have you started to form plans on how it may affect all steps of the software development life cycle? Not just, not just code yeah. generation, but you, know, you alluded to some of the, the planning, yeah. but also like the data engineering, the, the analysis, even the, um, if it's relevant in, in operations itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, um, 
in the, in the last 6 months we've had at least two internal hackathons where first the machine learn the machine learning platform built the right set of building blocks and asked engineers hey like think about all of the ideas mm -hmm. and then like we and we've had amazing ideas across the board so if you think like all the way from trying to onboard to a new system now I can take all of the Uber knowledge that's siloed and then help engineers onboard to new space. I can help you with code suggestions. I can help you with maybe if I'm doing code reviews, I can give you the contextual suggestions. And I can go back and fix all of the lint issues in the in the repository and generate code reviews for you that you can accept and land. So I can clean up our code base so that it's more maintainable. And then on the AI ops, we can build assistance for on-call engineers to give them the right contextual information so that it helps them to mitigate the issue faster. Um, for analysts, we can give them, they can write natural language and we can convert them into queries and give using the right blessed tables and columns so that they don't have to set up the right join conditions, right where clauses because they can express, hey, I want to do how many trips happen in San Francisco with this kind of constraints and we can convert that into a query. So we are thinking about, you know, different cohorts of employees and then figuring out what is the best fit uh, that can help them really kind of a co-pilot for them to optimize their day to day so that we can offload some amount of work for them and so that they can focus on the important parts. Our, our time with you always flies, Uday. We hope you, we can have you back and, <laughs> uh, and dig deeper. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you yeah. so much. It's very clear you're getting ROI out of AI, which is yeah. a big theme here. We want to help people understand those who are actually applying it in practical terms. So thank you for Yeah, sharing. thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Yeah, you Great you. Very welcome. Okay, keep it right there. We have Walmart's up next. Uh, last, uh, a couple super clouds ago, we heard about the Walmart cloud native platform and their super cloud, well, they're built, they built a, an abstraction layer on top of that called Element, and Paul Gillen talks to Hari Vasudev, who's an executive vice president at Walmart, about their ML and AI platform. So keep it right there, SuperCloud 6, we'll be right back. Mm -hmm.